The 20th century saw two world wars fought. The First World War lasted from 1914 to 1918. The Second World War lasted from 1939 to 1945. In 1939, Adolf Hitler ordered the German army to invade Poland, thus beginning World War II in Europe. Hitler hoped to regain natural resources, land, and power lost after Germany's defeat in World War I, which ended in 1918. From 1929 to 1941, the United States and other countries were suffering from the effects of the Great Depression. This event limited Japanese trading with other countries. Because they were searching for raw materials in larger markets, Japan invaded China in 1937. As a result of this, and in an attempt to stop Japanese aggressions in Asia, the United States stopped trading with Japan and placed an embargo on oil and other natural resources. On December 7, 1941, Japan attacked the United States at Pearl Harbor on the island of Oahu. Their goal? To disable the United States Navy Pacific Fleet. If they did, the United States would be able to quickly stop Japan from invading Indonesia and obtaining oil. The Japanese strategy backfired. The United States declared war on Japan on December 8, 1941. Japanese immigrants and Chinese Americans had faced prejudice and discrimination for many years. Japanese immigrants started coming to the United States in the mid-1800s with the gold rush, and many more came to help build the Transcontinental Railroad. California had passed laws preventing Japanese, Chinese, and other Asian immigrants from becoming citizens or owning land. In 1882, Congress passed the Asian Exclusion Act which outlawed Chinese immigrants from entering the United States. In 1921 and 1924, Congress passed more immigration acts targeting Asian immigrants. Immediately after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, newspapers accused Japanese Americans of possibly helping Japan. Many people then believed that because Japanese Americans looked like the enemy, they may be disloyal and actually help the enemy. General John L. DeWitt of the Western Defense Command urged Japanese Americans to be removed from the West Coast since they might help Japan invade. Other influential people, such as William Randolph Hearst, an American business management and leading newspaper publisher, William F. Nolan, a California state senator and assembly member, and Earl Warren, California's attorney general, also urged Congress and President Roosevelt to remove Japanese Americans from all West Coast states. On February 19, 1942, President Franklin D. Roosevelt issued Executive Order 9066, which required all Japanese Americans to leave their homes, jobs, and businesses. On October 7, 1941, exactly two months before the attack at Pearl Harbor, Curtis B. Munson, a Detroit businessman working for the U.S. State Department, submitted his report on Japanese on the west coast of the United States to the White House. This 29-page document is referred to as the Munson Report. It showed that Japanese Americans were loyal and trustworthy citizens. What's true? Many people were convinced that Japanese Americans may be disloyal because they look like the enemy. When the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, our west coast became a potential combat zone. Living in that zone were more than 100,000 persons of Japanese ancestry, two-thirds of them American citizens, one-third aliens. We knew that some among them were potentially dangerous. Japanese Americans may be disloyal because they look like the enemy. Forced to leave their homes, approximately 120,000 Japanese Americans were relocated to internment camps. They had three to seven days to sell or store their belongings. They sold furniture, cars, and other possessions for often less than 10% of their value. Families had to struggle to find homes for their pets, and many had to be left behind. Families were only allowed to take what they could carry in one suitcase. 
but most people didn't have enough space in one suitcase. So most people wrapped their belongings in sheet bundles. They were loaded into trucks and were sent to First Living Quarters assembly centers. The assembly centers were located in country fairgrounds or racetracks. Barbed wire fences surrounded the areas and uniformed American soldiers were loaded with loaded guns patrolled the area. The architecture of the temporary housing couldn't keep up with numerous amounts of people arriving at the centers. Many people had to live in horse stalls where the smell of manure lingered. After multiple months at the assembly centers, Japanese Americans were relocated to one of 10 internment camps, or in some words, detention camps, located in desolate areas in the U.S. The living conditions in the internment camps was not much better than that of the assembly centers. People lived in long one-story barracks divided in four to six rooms called apartments. Workers often built the barracks quickly with untreated row lumber and covered the outer walls with tar paper, heavy-duty paper with tar mixed in. Without insulation in the walls, it was very hot in the summer and freezing cold in the winter. The walls and floors often contained cracks, allowing wind, dust, and insects to enter rooms. Mm. Rooms did not have running water, like electrical outlets, or bathrooms. The only furniture provided was metal cots, army blankets, and pot belly stoves for heating in a single light bulb. Every block of barracks housed approximately 250 to 300 interns and had a mess hall, laundry room, latrines, or a bathroom and showers and a recreation hall, recreation. shower, recreation hall. Shower and toilet areas had neither doors nor curtains. Everyone was waited in long lines to use the bathroom, wash clothes, and eat. Most of the food didn't taste good. Portions were small, and many people did not have enough to eat. Everyone hurried to eat their meals so another could enter the mess hall and eat their meals. Snacks were not always available between meals. The kids who had enough money for snacks waited in long lines at the snack shop. When the, when the shop ran out of snacks, the door closed on the line. As months passed, Japanese Americans worked hard to improve their living conditions. They built table, chairs, and dressers by tearing apart wooden crates and scraps of lumber. Trees and gardens began to flourish outside the barracks. Coming from good farming areas, many people knew how to develop the empty land into productive farmland. And a couple a couple camps were so successful that they provided fresh ve fresh vegetables for the camp as well as outlying communities. Some Japanese Americans were fortunate to have jobs at the camps. Paid, paid the highest salary was the medical doctors who received $19 a month. Other workers made between $9 and $16 a month. Designated barracks contained a school, a store, movie theater, library, and a room to check out toys. After the United States dropped atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Japan surrendered on August 14, 1945, marking the end of the Second World War. People in internment camps celebrated the end of the war and anticipated the day they would finally get to go home. Within the next couple months, everyone received $25 and permission to leave the camp. Families who returned to their homes often found that their possessions in government storage buildings were either missing or had been damaged. There were many people who didn't return to their former communities because of the fact they lost their homes, farms, and businesses. Even outside the barbed wire fences, the Japanese Americans had to continue to face discrimination and unfair treatment. 
We may be different in skin tone, eyes, faces, and more, but just because we're different and a different race doesn't mean we want to be put in terrible places like internment camps for something we may or may not have done. We recently met with Mariel Sukamoto, former internee of Jerome, Arkansas internment camp, to talk about her experience. What message would you want to send to people today and in the future about the internment? I'm so glad you asked that question because you know, one of the reasons why I'm here, one of the reasons why my mother started the Time of Remembrance program, was not just to tell our story, because that's only important in the sense that we don't want this to happen to another group. If we don't tell our story, if students like you, who will grow up to be adults, responsible people in the community, uh, leaders, how will you prevent this from happening to another group? First of all, you have to recognize when someone's rights are being taken away. And unfortunately, 9066, which was an executive order signed by Franklin Delano Roosevelt in 1942, that allowed someone to take us out of our homes without even saying, oh, you know, I think you stole something, or you know, you, you uh, were disloyal to the country. They didn't have to say that. They just took us based on the possibility that we might do something. Just like going up to someone and saying, well, you know, I'm going to arrest you before you can do something wrong. Well, that's absolutely against constitutional law, and it's, it's, it's crazy. You know, how can you predict what someone might do? And Executive Order 9066 was rescinded, erased, by Gerald Ford, who was a president a long time ago. And then when George W. Bush, the last President Bush, went into office and after 9-11, he signed something called the Patriot Act. Guess what? It's the same thing. And with the Patriot Act, he was able to uh, let uh, the Army and different authorities round up people that they thought might be dangerous to this country, even though they had done nothing wrong based on the word of somebody that wasn't even a witness and put them in Guantanamo Bay. Have you heard about Guantanamo Bay? Well, that's a place where it's a prison camp. And when you are uh, arrested, you get a lawyer. But if you are not arrested, if you are just being detained, you can't have a lawyer. If you have a lawyer, the lawyer can make sure that you come before a judge and you get to prove yourself innocent. And if the state can prove you guilty, then you know you could be sentenced. But if you're detained, you have no lawyer, you have no court date, and you can stay there forever. We can't allow that kind of law to exist.